Okay, well, I'm going to make a start. As I mentioned a few moments ago, uh, I think we may have fouled up here in that the, t the, the time we've advertised this as starting is 1700 hours GMT instead of 1700 hours GMT plus one. So I might end up doing this twice. At the moment, we are, uh, um, how many people have we got? We've got about 38, which is half of what I'd have expected. We have 200 people um, registered, so 38 is a little bit light. So I might be doing this, uh, this one through twice. So good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Good afternoon to those of you joining us from the East Coast. And good evening to anyone joining us from Europe uh, or stations further east. And a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining this, the 15th of our regular series of short courses on pumping topics. This one will last about 40 minutes and it will allow us plenty of time for a Q&A session after the presentation. So let me share the screen. And here is a listing of the previous short courses we've run during the last year. If you've missed any of them, you can get a copy of the materials from our website. Use the following link, this one here. Or go to rawpumpen.com and follow the link to RP short courses. Go to rawpumpen.com, you get to this screen and here is the link to the RP short courses. If you click on that, it takes you to this screen, which you can also access directly with this link. And you will see all the courses that we've done listed, and you can click on any of them to see the course material. This is what we're covering today, the beginner's guide to startup, commissioning, and troubleshooting of centrifugal pumps. Now, a 40 minute session is most certainly not going to turn you into qualified commissioning engineers, but it will point you in the right direction and enable you to have an intelligent conversation with a commissioning engineer. I'm indebted to Jennifer Knox and Ian James for the vast majority of the material you'll see here today. We'll hold a Q&A session at the end, so Please at any time use the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen, Q&A facility rather than the chat, please. Use that to ask any questions you may have or any comments you may want to make. I'll address those that I can live at the end of the session and the rest will address by mail in the coming days. We are recording this session and we'll make it available to all attendees as a YouTube link, as well as by emailing you a PDF version of this slideshow with all the speakers notes and some quite a lot of additional notes as well, some additional material. Um, we'll also send you the Q&A summary from both of today's sessions, or the way it's looking at the moment, maybe four sessions. Here's a summary of what we're going to cover in today's session. I won't read it to you, I think you can read. Okay, commissioning and startup. It's the final step before production runs in a processing plant. Project commissioning is the process of assuring that all systems and components of an industrial plant are designed, installed, tested, operated, and maintained according to the operational requirements of the owner or final client. The picture we show here is of a raw pump and crude oil pump commissioned in India, supplied to India's largest oil and gas PSU in an East India location. So startup and commissioning, they're essentially the same thing. Steps are taken to properly prepare the equipment for startup and eventual commissioning into fully operational process conditions. 
Once the equipment is up and running, it's brought to operational condition and it's run for a period of time to ensure there are no issues. If any problems arise, then the troubleshooting process is started. What we have here is a picture of a main oil line pump, a BB-1 pump installed in India. So general precautions and startup checks. Firstly, rotate the pump shaft by hand. It should rotate freely with no rubbing. On a small pump, you may be able to turn it literally by hand. On a larger pump, you may need to use a pipe wrench on the coupling spacer. Now, it's important to check the driver rotation to make sure it matches the pump direction of rotation, the arrow on the pump casing. In some cases, pump, pumps may operate in reverse and could be running at only a third of the design performance. Now, this sounds obvious, but it obviously isn't, in fact. I spoke to one of my commissioning engineers when I was working for Ibarra Cryodynamics and asked him, how frequently do pumps get wired up the wrong way? And he said, more often than you can possibly imagine. It's unbelievable how frequently it happens. Um, and so just check it. <laughs> Number three, well, it's good practice to flush the piping system or flush the piping of the system in which the pump is to be in, is installed. If it's in hot service, then use the warm up lines and allow ample time for the pump case to heat up. The general rule of thumb is 100 degrees Fahrenheit temperature rise every hour. But if it's a, 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 a hot in hot oil service with a big um, temperature difference, it might be, might be longer than that. You might have to take it more steadily than that. What you must do, you must read the instruction manual and look at the warm up procedures. This will avoid thermal shock to the casing and impeller and prevent damage to the mechanical seal. Now, warm up, of course, won't be needed for all cases. It's just when it's required, if you're, and for, especially on hot oil type service, Make sure you follow the procedure exactly. Finally, don't operate below minimum continuous stable flow as shown on the performance curve. You can start it up at closed valve usually, uh, but typically for no more than 15 or 20 seconds, you want to be operating out on the curve beyond the minimum continuous flow within 15 or 20 seconds. Checks of the mechanical seal. Well, what I show here is pretty generic. Check the seal IOM for individual requirements. This is um, from an Eagle Bergman uh, IOM uh, for then non-API seal. <clears throat> Check the seal assembly fixtures. Well, the assembly fixtures provide for holding the cartridge seal in one piece during transport, storage, assembly, and removal. Make sure you remove these before you start up. Pipe connections means seal flush, quench, leakage plan connections. Disposal connection, well, this is the seal leakage plan, maybe a plan 65, for example. Check the rotation of the seal matches the rotation of the pump. So check the seal drawing. Now, depending on the seal design or type, a seal run in reverse could be damaged or leak. Others are bidirectional and no serious damage will be done. Heat generated by an improperly installed seal could incur further damage to the pump. Flush the pump and seal area with flushing fluid under little to no pressure. Finally, thoroughly vent the seal chamber, especially if it is a non-self-venting pump. So a BB1 type pump would, um, would definitely require venting. An OH2 or a BB2 with top top would probably self-vent. Startup procedure. This 
really shouldn't need saying. But you know the old adage, finally, if all else fails, read the instruction manual. Well, that's why we put it in. Here we have the startup procedure. These are all the checks that you should be doing. Note here, we want to make sure the pump is full of liquid and make sure it's fully vented. If there is air still in the system and it's not been vented properly, it will naturally rise and collect at high points within the system, within the pump and within the piping system. Well, this trapped air can cause pump failures and corrosion and flow issues, water hammer and pressure surges. It also makes the pump work harder, resulting in additional energy consumption. So make sure you've vented the entire system. Again, checking the correct rotation, checking the priming. When you're running, never allow the pump to run too long with the discharge valve closed. In 20 seconds maximum. The energy applied to the product through recirculation within the pump case would be converted into heat. Temperature of the liquid may reach its boiling point and vaporize, which could cause pump seizure and mechanical seal failure. Here is a commissioning checklist. Now, most of these are double checks. These are tasks which should have already been carried out and checked during installation long before startup, but it's wise to check them again. This is the commissioning checklist from the, from the IOM of an OH2 or BB2 pump. I apologize, it's a little small and tricky to read. Um, I'll leave it on screen for a few seconds to let you read it. You can look at it in more detail when you get the hard copy of this presentation. Moving on to troubleshooting. Well, the first step in troubleshooting is gathering information on the issue, such as an undesired behavior or lack of expected functionality. Maybe it's noise, maybe it's vibration or lack of flow. Other important information includes related symptoms and special circumstances that may be required to reproduce the issue. For example, if it's a vibration, maybe it only occurs at higher flows, for example, or lower flows. These are, would be examples. Once the issue and how to reproduce it are understood, the next step might be to eliminate unnecessary components in the system and verify that the issue persists to rule out incompatibility and third party causes. So for example, if there's a bypass line, you might want to close that off and see if that solves the particular problem that you've identified. First requirement is to ensure that no cavitation of the pump is occurring throughout the broad operating range. And then that a certain minimum continuous stable flow is always maintained. Clear understanding of the concept of cavitation, its symptoms, its causes, and its consequences is essential in effective analysis and troubleshooting of the cavitation problem. Fortunately, we covered this in quite some detail in session five, NPSH made simple. So you're all experts in this area, but just in case, go back and review that session. Cavitation sounds like a handful of gravel rattling around in the pump. So the first thing to establish is where you're operating on the curve. 
if you're running out here to the right of BEP, classic lack of NPSH available cavitation is quite likely. If you're running back here to the left of BEP, suction or discharge low flow cavitation is likely. Never operate continuously below the pump supplier determined minimum continuous flow. No more than a few minutes at a time, followed by a return to higher flow. If you operate below minimum continuous standards, minimum continuous flow, these are what you're risking. Cavitation, as I said, we covered this in, um, in session five, but here's a reminder. Um, this is classic lack of NPSHA cavitation. Cavitation is the formation of bubbles or cavities in the liquid, developed in areas of relatively low pressure around an impeller. The imploding or collapsing of these bubbles triggers intense shock waves inside the pump, causing significant damage to the impeller and or to the pump housing. And this is suction and discharge recirculation cavitation, which can also cause problems which are often considered misdiagnosed as being uh, uh, NPSH cavitation. When you operate away from BEP, you will get recirculation vortices here in the suction and here in the discharge. On now and look at five common problems. No liquid delivery, low liquid flow rate, intermittent flow, low discharge pressure, and excess power. Firstly, no liquid delivery. First thing to look at would be instrument error. Look for any issues there. It's the simple things to check first. Check if the pump has been adequately primed. Check for cavitation. Maybe you have severe cavitation, which will affect pump delivery from the, uh, from the pump discharge. And maybe the supply tank is empty. Surprising how often this occurs during commissioning. So check the upstream tank. If there isn't a good level there over and above the NPSH required of the pump, then the pump may be wrongly accused of problems. Commissioning is often carried out with only a partially filled system. So that tank might only be half full and there might not be enough NPSH. Next one, liquid flow rate low. Again, instrument error is the first thing to check. Cavitation, early stage cavitation, it might restrict the, uh, the flow. There are non-condensables in the liquid. Maybe there is presence of air from another line tied into the suction side of the pump. Or maybe the inlet strainer is clogged. Quite common in commissioning. Intermittent operation. Maybe the flow is oscillating or surging. One or two reasons. Again, cavitation, the beginnings of onset of cavitation will restrict the flow. Maybe the pump is not properly primed and you're getting slugs of air occurring from time to time. Or again, non-condensables. Maybe a mix of liquid with air, which can cause this, and it can come through in slugs. Discharge pressure, low. Instrument error, of course. Again, non-condensables. Possibly the speed is too low. If it's a variable speed operation, maybe you've got a, a VFD, check the control of the VFD. And as we mentioned earlier, wrong direction of rotation. Check if it's installed spinning correctly. Um, it, this can reduce the, uh, the, the, the performance of the pump to about a third of the expected values. Next one. Excessive, excessive power, could be that the speed is too high, so check the speed of the motor. 
check the, the control of the VFD if one is fitted. The density of the liquid could be high. Maybe density is changing. Maybe during commissioning, the temperature of the system is below what it will be in the finished plant. So the density could have changed and could be higher. And similarly, the viscosity could be high for the same reason. And again, if the system is only half full, maybe the required system head is lower than expected and the, the pump needs to compensate for that. The next few slides have some useful fault find, finding charts. Um, I'm going to go, th I'm not going to go through them in detail. Um, they are self-explanatory. Um, I'll leave each one on the screen for about 20 seconds or so, so you can get the hang of it. And you can, of course, when you get the PDF copy of this presentation, you'll be able to look at them in more detail. I apologize for the quality of these next three slides. Um, it's a little bit difficult to read. I apologize for that. This is the last one. Next, we will check five major pump parameters. Vibration, power, flow, head, and temperature. Centrifugal pumps generally operate for years, trouble-free. If there are problems, then there have probably been early indications that can help provide a solution. Knowing how to identify the many potential pump vibration causes will quickly lead to the potential culprit and to the solution. The next few slides are intended to give guidance as to the likely cause and the solution, and will assist operations, maintenance, and the pump and seal vendors customer service guys to efficiently solve the problem. First, vibration. In the attempt to solve vibration problems on a pump and motor should begin with a basic frequency analysis using a portable vibration analyzer like this one. In most cases, a single vibration frequency will be dominant, often at rotating speed. Then, by simple process of elimination, you can zero in on the source of the problem. Detailed spectral analysis is a specialist field. Now, I'm not qualified to lecture on this, and it's well beyond this 40 minute short course. But this is the kind of analysis that a vibration specialist can offer. But in the next eight slides, I give you my vibration analysis for dummies. It's a crib sheet to give you a clue as to what might be happening to your pump. So you've seen this before in session nine on pump instrumentation. So this is a refresher and I'll speed through these. So looking at the first slide, frequencies in the region of 0 to 40% of running speed. 
Well, 10% of the time it's seal faces, 20% of the time wearings are rubbing, 20% of the time radial bearing damage, 90% of the time it's the thrust bearing damage, and 40% of the time casing mounting bolts to base plate are loose. So this gives you a real clue as to things to check. And this I would suggest will be the first one to check because it can be done without dismantling the pump. So a similar story here. I'm not going to go through every slide in detail. You get the picture. I'm going to leave each one up for about 20 seconds. Um, so you can have a look. And again, you can review them in detail when you get the, the hard copy PDF. This, this one is in, no, not this one, next one, sorry. <clears throat> yep. This one's interesting, peeps at running speed. 90% of the time, rotor imbalance or bent shaft. And 40% of the time, misalignment. So obviously check the misalignment first before you dismantle the pump. Two times running frequency, 50% of the time, excessive piping forces and moments, and 50% of the time, misalignment. Vane passing frequency, the frequency at which the impeller vanes pass the volute lips or cutwaters. This is a possible design issue on a new installation. It's not uh, a maintenance or wear issue. It's unlikely to appear in the field. Cavitation is associated with very high frequency vibrations, but with peaks that are varying frequently. You'll also have noise and vibration. Vibration was the first of the five major parameters. Number two is power. This is a fault finding flowchart for high motor current. And here are some possible reasons for an unexpected power increase. And here, possible reasons for a power decrease. Here we have a fault finding flow chart for low flow or low head. And here we see possible reasons for an unexpected change in flow or head. And finally, if we see an unexpected change in bearing temperature. The last 10 minutes of this session will be looking at mechanical seals. 
Seal salesman once told me that 90% of pump problems show up as mechanical seal problems, and that 90% of seal problems are actually pump problems. Um, most often, a mechanical seal can be like a barometer for the pump, helping users to understand the state of health of the pump and the pump system. Other times, occasionally, failure is a result of poor seal selection or seal installation errors. Here are some of the most common reasons mechanical seals fail. Allowing your pump to run dry can be very damaging to a mechanical seal. Under the wrong conditions, mechanical seals can experience thermal shock and shatter within 30 seconds or less. Pump vibration is caused by pump imbalance or improper alignment, operating the pump too far to the right or to the left of best efficiency point on the curve. Vibration hurts your equipment and can result in damaged seals and shortened seal life. When rotating components are out of balance, the mechanical seal faces can separate because of the induced vibration and shaft run out. The seal faces can become damaged as the vibration causes the carbon face to bounce against the hard face to chatter. When it comes to pumps, hammers are not our friends. Mechanical seal faces can be very fragile. Pounding couplings onto the shaft will damage the mechanical seal. Skipping the initial startup procedures and installation errors are a big factor when it comes to mechanical seal failure. Improperly starting the pump can cause the motor to trip and the shaft to twist, causing orbital movement resulting in internal parts, contact, seal failure, and shortened bearing life. Improperly installing the mechanical seal will cause damage to elastomers, O-rings, or boots, along with a wide variety of other issues, as pictured here on the left. Mechanical seals can be very sensitive because the faces are incredibly flat. Even small amounts of dirt or oil, even fingerprints, can cause the faces not to align. The picture on the right shows the spacer became lodged in the seal, damaging the internal components. Now, the installation instructions stated to remove the spacers before starting the unit, so clear somebody didn't read the IOM. It's critical that a mechanical seal flush plan is properly in place. No mechanical seal recommendation is complete without a coordinating flush plan. If no flush plan exists, then dewatered product and contaminants can build up, causing excessive heat or erosion on the seal, resulting in shortened seal life. Lack of knowledge and information accounts for the majority of mechanical seal installation errors. You should consider the normal operating conditions, as well as the potential for off design conditions and non process activities such as cleaning, steaming, acid, and caustic flushes. The picture here is an example of poor material choice for an abrasive liquid. Pump application engineers and salesmen should always consult the mechanical seal suppliers before quoting. Always send the process and mechanical data sheet to the seal suppliers. And the same for EPC rotating equipment engineers before specifying a seal type. Consult the experts, consult the mechanical seal suppliers. We'll look briefly at five types of sealing failures. Failure of the mechanical shaft seal is the most common cause of pump downtime. The shaft seal is exposed to widely varying operating conditions. And sometimes these operating conditions can change to become quite different from the specific conditions for which the seal was intended. The diagrams here show that shaft seal failure is by far the most common cause, or more accurately, the most common symptom of pump system failure. 
Remember, 90% of pump problems show up as mechanical seal problems, but 90% of seal problems are actually pump problems or pump system problems. In the following slides, we'll review some examples of common causes of failure of mechanical shaft seals, the ones that show up here. On all these slides, there are additional helpful explanatory notes, which you'll see when you get the hard copy PDF version, but I'm not going to read them out here. So operational failures, about 40% due to operational errors. Twenty-four percent mechanical failures, such as shaft misalignment, coupling imbalance, impeller imbalance. Nine percent seal component failures. You'll recall just now I said ninety percent of them are down to pump or pump system failure uh, problems. Here is the missing 10%, which are down to mechanical seal failures. System design failures, 19% of failures due to a poor system design. So seal flush arrangement, if it's a dual seal with barrier fluids, where's the seal pot? Where, how's the piping being run? and the pump installation. If you've got a bad pump piping layout into the suction of a pump, you'll get vibration. And everything else is 8%. Mechanical seals are a major factor in rotating equipment reliability. They're responsible for leaks and failures of the system, but they also indicate problems that would eventually cause serious damage down the road. Seal reliability is greatly affected by the seal design and the operating environment. Two more slides now, seal troubleshooting. This is really for mechanical seal specialists, not for us pump guys, but it's useful background reading for us. So these are the things that a seal workshop will want to examine. When you get the hard copy PDF of this course, you'll see quite a few additional notes um, that I've added below here. And here, finally, a few more things that the SEAL workshop will be looking at. Well, that pretty much concludes the fun for today. I hope you found it useful. I just get to advertise the next of the short courses, which is on positive displacement pumps. An introduction for those of us who are more familiar with centrifugal pumps. 21st of April, that's three weeks today. Again, two sessions, one for the Eastern Hemisphere and one for the Western Hemisphere. The invitation will be published very soon, so put it in your diary. I'm going to leave the meeting open for a little while to allow you to post in the Q&A box, and I'll endeavor to answer those that only need a short answer here and now. Those that need a fuller answer will be answered within a few days. Anything you think of later, info at shortcoursesrawpumpen.com. Our marketing team are standing by to direct your questions to, or suggestions to the best person to answer them. And that's probably me. Um, but they will also, they're the ones that will be sending you the YouTube recording and the PDF of this presentation with all the additional notes and my speaking notes. And they'll also send you the summarized Q&A from today's sessions. If you need a Certificate of completion for this short course. Again, drop an email, please, to info at shortcourses.rawpumpen.com. And here, right at the end, are eight slides about raw pumpen that remind you of who we are and what we do. They'll be in the PDF copy of the presentation you get so you can peruse them at your leisure. 
And now on with the Q&A. Let's have a look and see if we have any questions. And there are currently no open questions, which is unusual. I must be getting better at this lecturing if you've got no questions. Uh, let's look in the chat and there's nothing in the chat. Now we have a question. Daniel Bloom has said, due to possible lack of knowledge, it's advisable that your commissioning and startup instructions state the limitation on time that the discharge valve shall be opened after startup. Yep, good point. And I'm quite sure that it does. It's very strong on minimum continuous flow. Jerry Hallam here. Karasik used to emphasize suction specific speed versus operating point versus BEP. Any comment? Uh, yes, I mean, if we're talking, it rather very much depends on the type of pump that, um, that, that we're talking about. Most process pumps are, um, do not have a high suction specific speed. Um, and so they have a broad operating range. Pumps that do have a, uh, a high suction specific speed will probably have a very narrow operating region to be able to operate in. Um, this demands a better answer than I can give you in 30 seconds. So I will take a little time and write a proper answer in the, in the Q&A. Daniel Bloom again says, usually people on site do not have this information and, and do endless arguing on this. Well, I think it's critical that when you do the, um, the commissioning and startup, you should have the pump curve there, the pump performance curve, and that will nearly always show the minimum continuous allowable flow. I've always considered that there are two um, minimum flows. One is the continuous, minimum continuous flow, and the other is the minimum intermittent flow. Now the minimum intermittent flow would might be a flow that is about half of the minimum continuous stable flow, the continuous flow, and it's okay to run it at that for say five or 10 minutes at a time, followed by a period of a couple of hours above the minimum continuous flow. So intermittent flow and continuous flow. Tetsu Ai Chan, what percentage of rated flow is usually the minimum continuous flow? I've seen varying figures from 10% to 30%. Could you advise, please? Yes, it will be varying figures between 10 and 30%, and it can be as high as 50%. It will depend on the type of pump. Um, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, you really have to look at the performance curve and check, check with that. Jerry Hallam again has said, it will be nice to see a curve relating operating point on the curve versus radial forces on the impeller. Okay, yeah, noted. Yes, that might, that would be valuable information. I'll, I'll, I'll try and prepare a slide like that. Thank you. Sagar Sonavane. Excuse me if I pronounced it wrongly. Selection of lubricating oil. Is it based on kinematic or dynamic viscosity and why? Sorry, it's a bit too detailed a question for me. I can't immediately answer that. I would, um, I'll, I'll, I'll need to speak to our engineering department to get you an, a firm answer on that. Juan Bello has said, should you start up the pump with the discharge valve open? going only against the check valve. Well, that's possible. If you are operating against an open valve, that's usually the, peer, the area of highest power consumption. So you need to be sure that your pump will actually cover the flow all the way out to the end of the, end of the curve. Um, that is, 
If it is, then that's a possible way of opening. The kindest way is normally against a partially cracked open valve. Uh, that's usually the lowest power scenario for most process pumps. But if it's a very big axial flow water pump, then the highest power can be at shutoff. So under those circumstances, you don't want to be operating it uh, out there. You would probably want to start against an open valve. Okay, that appears to be all the questions at the moment. Which case? Oh, maybe another one here. There we go, from Jerry Hallam, a very well, well known and well experienced name in the pump industry. This, um, he says, I always started at closed discharge, but a lot of people want to start with an open valve. That seems to be risky. Any comment? Yeah, I think it's uh, as I just mentioned uh, uh, now. If you op operate against an open valve, if you start up against an open valve, you're probably at the maximum power of the uh, of the, of the pump rather than the minimum power of the pump. Okay, well that would appear to be it for the moment, in which case I'll say uh, thank you very much for attending today. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, preparing and presenting it. I hope you found it useful um, and I look forward to seeing you all on the uh, 21st of, 21st of, uh, of April for the next session on positive displacement pumps. Thanks guys and bye-bye.